So I want to say congratulations to Charles Isbell on getting his Nareps keynote. I think they couldn't have made a better choice and I'm so glad they chose him. When Michael Littman and Charles asked me to talk about fairness in the field of machine learning, I was thinking that I really didn't have much to say about this because I thought everyone already knew it and it was all obvious and it was only a sentence or two, but then when I wrote it all down, it was a little bit more than I thought. Okay, so how did the field of machine learning get to this place where we have unfair algorithms impacting society, pervasive racial bias in our data sets, and so few blacks and women in machine learning? I have a hypothesis on how this happened historically, and I'm not totally sure about this, and there's no way to test it scientifically, I don't think, but, um, but I think it's reasonable. And there's some actionable things that we can do, if I'm right, to help us solve the issue. Okay, so the bottom line is that the field of machine learning uh, does, did not and still does not accommodate sufficiently diverse views of what constitutes top data science. And more specifically, machine learning traditionally has not cared about data, nor about researchers who care about data as opposed to researchers who care about algorithms or theory. And this is what I believe has driven the field into this mess. I mean, everyone knows that NIRIPS is kind of trendy, right? The field go through, goes through trends. But I think this trendiness is exactly the blindfold that allowed us to walk into this mud pit. So let's go back a few years and let's what, talk about what would happen to someone's career when they wanted to publish uh, machine learning applied to a societal issue of importance. So any application, could they have gotten that published in NIPS 2008, for instance? So I have like, you know, a random selection here of NIPS 2008 papers. Obviously many of these papers are important but how many of them would be interesting to people beyond machine learning who are interested in improving society? A few, <laughs> very few. Um, but let's take this a little further, right? Let's consider an academic researcher before 10 years ago who just wanted to improve the world using machine learning. Let's say they work on a new application, they spend a year on it, a tremendous amount of time in collecting data, data processing, troubleshooting their model, and they got some beautiful results that really make a difference in the way someone views the world or has a positive impact on society or its infrastructure, or it's something that an, a wider audience might appreciate. It's novel scientifically, but they didn't need a new algorithm to accomplish their goal. And if they developed one, their victory wouldn't be because of that algorithm. It would be because of the work they did to get to the point where they could apply machine learning and um, in the novel framing of the problem. So how could the researcher have published this work back then? It was hard. <laughs> and now we call this kind of work data science and there's some level of respect for it. But back then there was no field of data science. This was applied machine learning. And, now, and it was really hard to publish applied machine learning in any high, highly respectable uh, conference. Applied machine learning was second class machine learning. And that's why, you know, why we now have a bunch of new journals and conferences on data science, because the field of machine learning wasn't willing to call data science top machine learning. And uh, there were a couple of exceptions, like KDD has an applied track, but with NIPS and ICML, not so much in the last 20 years or so. Okay, so we have this narrow set of trendy topics admitted to NIPS, but that meant that there was no reliable top conference um, to publish top quality data science. And to be really successful, you had to really value things the way that the NIPS community did. You had to kind of follow the trends, whether it was kernels back 20 years ago or non-parametric Bayesian analysis 10 years ago or novel architectures or theory for deep learning, that's like now. The thing is, for a vast number of data science problems, you don't actually need any of these things. I'm not saying that you don't need new techniques, you just don't always need these trendy kinds of techniques. If you're in a high stakes setting, Perhaps you're better off understanding and troubleshooting the data in the model and building in domain expertise and trying to you know, make your decisions relevant and trustworthy rather than designing something with a big complicated model that you don't understand. Anyway, so the field of machine learning research created algorithms and theory at the expense of focusing on the data or focusing on the full process of knowledge discovery, right? The way to discover knowledge from data. And then of course, non-trendy subfields were relegated to slow journals if they wanted to get published at all. And not only did this narrow set of NIPS-worthy topics exclude important societal problems, but it also excluded topics that were important in handling data and, and it, you know, handling data in reality. Like for years, it was, it was like very difficult to publish anything about interpretability in the conferences. And there was a lot of this kind of work that was important, but it wasn't trendy. And I call this, I, I call it fringe work because it wasn't trendy. 
Now, part of the issue is that the only evaluation metric that consistently mattered to reviewers was accuracy on a test set drawn from the same distribution as the training set. And this, is, this metric is really relevant only for low stakes decisions, right? Interpretability metrics did not matter. Domain specific metrics, they did not matter. You had to get test accuracy performance substantially better than the last paper, regardless of what other metrics you actually cared about. So um, what the field did was that it propelled researchers to, um, to create trendy algorithms for low stakes decisions at the expense of focusing on the data and the problems whose solutions have an actual benefit to society. So if you wanted to publish in NIPS or NERIPS, it was better if you live, like live and breathe these trendy topics. And what that narrowness to the field did, it narrowed who would want to come through the academic pipelines. Right? If you come through a training pipeline that valued these trends and taught you some serious linear algebra, you're pro you were probably in pretty good shape to publish at NIPS. But how many people did that leave out, right? How many people's values did that leave out? So I claim that um, excluding di diverse high quality work in machine learning equates to excluding diverse voices in machine learning. It leaves out people who think differently. It leaves out people who can never get into those pipelines because of what background they come from. And it leaves out people who don't wanna follow the trends. It leaves out people whose value system is different than the work being published at NIPS. And this narrowing out of the acceptable topics was amplified tenfold by the conference review process. So, you know, we all know that our field has low quality reviewing, right? Uh, AI and machine learning, they're the only fields I know where the reviewers for the very top venues are non-experts, right? They're sometimes students, they've sometimes never published a paper, and even if they have, it might not be in the areas where they're reviewing. And they often don't know how to judge work out of outside of a trending area, right? Low quality reviewing made this field an echo chamber. It's just really hard to find good reviewers for papers that are on the fringe. <laughs> so more of those papers get rejected, which narrows the ideas accepted to the conference to that set of trendy papers. So this alone makes things a lot worse. And on top of it all, we had automatic paper matching systems. And we all know that papers that are statistical outliers probably don't automatically match to reviewers well. So, you know, the people who really suffer from bad reviewing are on the fringe. Now, this is actually really easy to see if you submit multiple types of papers. So last year, I submitted a neural network paper and a decision tree paper to NeurIPS. And the neural network reviewers, they knew what they were talking about. But the, for decision trees, we repeatedly get reviewers who do things like ask about what regularization is, you know, the sort of stuff that I would teach in an introductory class. And with no mechanism to, to contest, um, the process continues like this year after year. Now, even if the review team was completely wrong, the volume of papers is just so large that they're not actually interested in doing a good job. So what they do is sloppy. The reviews are often, you know, insulting and unprofessional. And these kinds of words like Frankly, they're not appropriate for how we treat other humans, let alone provide a welcoming community for outsiders. Now, all this trendiness might not be so bad if the trendy topics were better aligned with societal good, but as I said, back then it wasn't, right? The trendy topics weren't particularly important to society at large. So by excluding applications papers, the researchers were out of touch from real world problems um, and and, and this is still ongoing, right? NIPS is not good with application papers. Now, some people might say I'm completely wrong about NIPS excluding application papers and many societally important papers. And I would like to provide some evidence for that statement because it's really quite clear. Okay, Foster Provo had a comment about this back in 1996 about ICML. And he wrote that, you know, what we take from the program committee's decisions, given the reviews, is that important lessons from the real world are not as important as the ability to bundle up the complexity of a real world problem into a nice, neat conference paper. Applied work is interesting only if it looks like good academic work. And then there was Carrie Wagstaff's paper in ICML 2012, where she said to a whole crowd of people at ICML that we weren't doing machine learning that mattered and told us what it would look like if we did. 
And then Kiri and I tried to help fix this problem by editing a special issue in MLJ for, you know, it's Machine Learning for Science and Society in 2013, 2014. We provided a place in the top tier where people could publish applied papers. And in our editorial for the special issue, we discussed at length what happens when our community doesn't have a top tier venue for data science. We, we miss the needs of society, which we have missed. We discover that our algorithms are missing the mark on real problems, which they were. We hinder career advancement for those who care about applying data mining or data science or machine learning to important societal problems, which we did and we still do. For a researcher to work on applied problems with no avenue for publication, no top avenue for publication, leads to problems with career advancement. This could, and already does, <laughs> present researchers with an unfortunate choice. They could either work on problems that are either important to society or beneficial to their own career, but not both. And finally, and basically what this means is that, you know, we just, we just lose diverse voices whose value system doesn't agree with NIPS. My own value system doesn't agree with NIPS. Now, you could say that we fixed all the problems now, but we haven't. If you look at the rating systems for computer science, like you know CS rankings, they don't yet count papers and data science venues. They only count ICML, KDD, and NERIPS. And not only that, but even the papers that are in the top journals with the higher quality peer review, those aren't even counted. JMLR is not in there, nor MLJ, and there's no data science conference or journals at all. So essentially, because of this feedback loop and the narrowing due to the review process, um, the field of machine learning was not tolerant to diverse ideas and heavily favored training through the linear algebra pipeline. So uh, what happened? <laughs> well, private companies took over. Bad stuff happened. They developed you know, proprietary models for high stakes decisions like credit risk, criminal justice, hiring. There was no oversight. There was no guidance from the top of the field. No committee on ethical uses of machine learning, no preparation for this to happen, because we, we forced people not to think about it. Um, many of our data sets and models are racially biased, and we have persuasive unfairness. And that, I think, is how we got here. So what do we do about it, right? Well, I think it all boils down to just one thing, right, the bottleneck. If we can just fix this, I think it would make a lot of difference, right? Would it be so bad for NeurIPS or ICML to have an applications track? Would it be so bad to change to a journal to, um, to ensure higher quality reviewing? Would it be so bad to insist on professional and constructive language in our reviews? Now, if you think <laughs> that the problems with NeurIPS and data science papers and review quality are already solved, I'd like to give you an example to show you that they aren't. Okay, so this year I submitted one paper to NERIPS. It was an applied paper on interpretable machine learning. The authors included three full professors, all women at top universities, uh, and three younger scientists. And I'm going to show you the full single review that I received for this paper. Okay, so this paper was desk, re desk rejected. And this is the full review, like I said, and the first part of it just looks like a form, like, you know, these are reasons why we desk reject papers. There's nothing really personalized there. The additional comments are where the really interesting um, uh, material is. <laughs> so the first comment is, this paper reads more like a very interesting blog post than an academic paper. Uh, and in particular, uh, there, there was no discussion of related work, we had 46 papers cited. Um, the use of interpretable seems like an attempt at buzzwording. Um, interpretable machine learning is the name of my field. <laughs> I gave a keynote at KDD in 2012 with interpretable machine learning in the title. It wasn't a back, it wasn't a buzzword back when I was working on it eight years ago, and it certainly is not just a buzzword now. It's, a, it's critically important to high stakes decisions made with machine learning. And um, this comment here on, um, you know, no exploration of alternative methods or baselines, you know, of course we had a full experimental section. So what is the review really saying here? 
It's saying your paper is not a real paper. It's just a blog post. Your field isn't even a real field. It's just a buzzword. By the way, this green comment um, that we solved the problem with a very simple decision tree, that's a typical slash that interpretable machine learning, right? They would have liked the model to be more complicated. We did a lot of optimization over years <laughs> right, to, to create algorithms that give you models that are that simple. So um, anyway, yeah, so they say the field isn't a real field. And so I didn't bother reading the paper. <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, I know these comments are false, but um, I put them in because I really wanted to make sure that your paper didn't get accepted and no one's going to challenge me on it. And oh, by the way, I, I made up a new word. <laughs> Okay, so this is exactly an example of what a review shouldn't be, right? Reviews generally should be written by someone with expertise. They should contain actual technical content. They should be constructive, not destructive. They should be friendly, and they should never be insulting, right? How can we, how do we take this field seriously if the, if the reviews look like this, right? So I emailed the program committee. I figured I should at least tell them so they could, you know, they could have the chance to, of doing something, right? If I were them, I would want authors to let me know if something like this happened to their paper if I was the PC. So there were a couple of emails between us, but the response of the PC was pretty surprising. So um, this is my letter to them. So I basically, you know, said, Here, we have this paper, we were disappointed that, they, that you're not going to even consider it. Um, and then I quoted from the reviewer and said, no, this is a real academic paper. This reviewer clearly has no idea how insulting their comments are. They're not an appropriate reviewer for, for any paper, let alone ours. We strongly suspect the reviewer wanted a methodological paper rather than an implied paper, but you know, we shouldn't be penalized for that. So um, anyway, so like I said, there was some emails between us and um, the PC said, uh, hi, Cynthia, again, I do apologize for the informal and insulting language of the AC comments that were shared with you and the other authors. The program chairs checked all of the comments that were shared and removed those that didn't meet our standards for politeness, but this one somehow slipped by us. However, we do stand by the decision. The AC and SAC for your paper both have 10 plus years of experience in applications and in machine learning, and we believe the process for summary rejections is both fair and has precedent in our field. So I read this and there were a few kind of shocking things that I sort of took from them. The first is that this person has over 10 years of experience who wrote that review. Now, that is much worse than if this person had just come from graduate school, right? If they didn't know how to write a review, like I could understand that, but 10 years out, they should know how to write a review by now, right? Um, it's sad for our com whole community to have had 10 plus years of this person and who knows how many similar ones. And then here, um, two people, two experienced people were responsible for that review. Both of them thought it was okay. And then, also, the fact that the program committee needed to prune multiple insulting comments manually. It wasn't just my paper. They imply that there were a lot of comments like this. But why are they pruning comments themselves, right? They should be telling the area chairs, hey, we don't treat people this way. These people worked hard on these papers for a year or two years, right? These are, these are students getting their insults. These are people's first paper and they care, right? So, I mean, the, 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 program committees, the program committee agreed also that this reviewer knows what they're talking about, but um, the PCs, they should have, the program committee should have easily seen that the AC had blatantly false statements in their review, right? We did have a related work section. We did have an experimental section, but they let the AC get away with it. And that's why we have this year after year. And that's why our community treats people like this, because we tolerate it. So after all these years, <laughs> after all these years, I still have cult culture shock in this community. And now you know why I sent in only one NERIP submission this year. Anyway, so let's, as a community, really try to clean up our act. Let's try to do better in including work that different kinds of people would find interesting. Not just those who think like the mainstream. There are many people out there whose work matters, but they just don't get a voice that's heard at the top of the field. Okay, so earlier I said that the machine learning community wasn't paying attention to data as opposed to algorithms and theory. And I want to give you an example of where that happened. And it's a famous example. <laughs> and um, it's, it's an example that Charles and Michael told me specifically that, that I should um, talk about. Anyway, so this is the ProPublica machine bias article. And it claims that there's an algorithm that's used across the criminal justice system in this country that is biased against black people. 
And the model they're talking about is called Compass. And Compass is proprietary. And it um, has potentially over 130 features in it. It's a complete black box. Uh, we don't know how the data are, you know, we don't know how the data are combined to form the, the predictions. And the company that makes it gets a profit from its use. And uh, the article, the ProPublica article, showed pairs of individuals, one black and one white person, where the black person had a lower or comparable criminal history, but a higher, higher compass score. And this article is commonly shown as a key example of AI unfairness in the justice system. And I wish people would stop showing this particular article as an example of that. Right? There's a huge amount of inequality and racial bias in the justice system, and there are so many things you could point to about racial bias, but the science in this particular article is completely wrong. So pointing to this article all the time, it's more of an indicator that we don't care about um, correct you know, data or, or correctness of science. Now, I just happen to have been pay, paying attention to this particular topic at the time that this article came out. So this article came out in May 2016, and we had written an article that was first published in March of 2015, so a year or so earlier on the same topic, which is recidivism prediction. And we had looked at many different types of recidivism um, for various types of crime, violent crime, sexual crime, property crime, drug crime, and so on. And um, the main claim or the main results of our paper were that um, most machine learning methods have similar performance across recidivism prediction problems, including these very interpretable machine learning modeling uh, methods. And we also found out that race was not useful for predicting recidivism, but it's correlated with criminal history. And it also happens to be correlated with age. So there was this like jarring discrepancy <laughs> between what we had published and what ProPublica wrote. So what we were seeing here is that the world was saying that, you know, we're, we're going to use this black box model because, you know, it's, it's necessary to do so. You're, you're gaining something from this complicated black box model. Whereas our paper said, um, you don't need black box models in the justice system. You know, interpretable models are just as good. And then ProPublica said that Compass depends on race after conditioning on agent criminal history. Whereas our paper said there's no need to use race after conditioning on age and criminal history, which means, you know, no reasonable model would actually use it, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just much easier to argue about fairness of a model when you actually know what's in it. Okay, so, so what happened here? So let's take a look with take a look at what ProPublica did with the data that they used, which was from Broward County, Florida. And it turned out they made a serious mistake in their analysis that people commonly make when they don't know about interpretable machine learning. They assume that when you approximate one function by another, that the variable importance stays the same. But it doesn't! <laughs> so um, if you have one function, like compass, which is possibly nonlinear, and you approximate it with another function, like a linear model, it does not mean that analyzing the variable importance of the linear model will tell you the importance of the variables in the black box. It's entirely possible that compass could depend on age and number of priors, whereas the linear approximation could also depend on race, which is correlated with both of these things because of systemic, you know, systemic racism in the justice system. Okay, so what ProPublica actually did was they showed that false positive and false negative rates varied by race. And then they suggested that this might not be a good comparison. We should condition on age and number of priors and re-examine. And then after conditioning on age and number of priors, they still found a linear approximation to compass with a low p-value for the race covariate, which of course indicates that race is important beyond age and number of priors. And so they then conclude, concluded that the compass uh, model depends on race. Okay, so let's, let's go, go through this again um, with a little bit more detail. So first of all, when you know, the false positive and false negative rates vary by race, right, this is a property of the data and not necessarily the model. Right? In Broward County, blacks in the database are younger and they have more priors due to systemic racism. Okay, so um, ProPublica then suggested that 
their comparison might not be a good one, and so we should condition on age and number of priors and re-examine. Okay, so that's a good idea. So when they did that, again, they still found a linear approximation with a low p-value for the raised covariate, but the mistake they made is right here. So we don't actually think compass is a linear model, and so their conclusion that compass depends on race is actually um, is actually not not a valid conclusion from from what from the type of analysis that they did. Um, so let me show you why ProPublica's assumption was particularly bad. So if you if you just plot, it's just a scatter plot of the compass. This is the compass violence score versus age. And you can see that there's this clear nonlinearity um, right on the bottom there, right? Uh, it's a, a fairly sharp cutoff of compass scores for each age. We think these are the minimum compass scores for each age. There were a few outliers, but you know, maybe there were some typos in the data set. But overall, not pointing to a linear function of age or a stepwise linear function or anything like that. And it looks like compass depends heavily on age here. And so when we took the remainder of compass minus this curve for age, and then we examined whether the remainder depends on race, um, then it all went away. Like <laughs> everything that ProPublica observed, it, it just wasn't there anymore. Um, so we ran machine learning methods with and without race to see if they need race to predict compass well, and they performed similarly. So compass didn't seem to depend on race anymore, other than through its correlations with age and criminal history. So you might be wondering how ProPublica found all these pairs of people where, um, you know, it really seems like Compass depends on race in addition to criminal history. Um, but I think the, the real problem is something different here. So first of all, if you look at these two people, the black person is much younger than the white person. So if Compass depends heavily on age, that could explain how this happened, right? Vernon Prater's old. So he doesn't get the same age points. And I'm not saying I agree with this, but if they had compared, if ProPublica had compared two people with the same age, then it would be much more convincing that, that Compass depends on race, in addition to this strong dependence on age. But I, I think the real problem with Compass is something different. Um, you know, the fact is that humans are not good at inputting data reliably. Uh, and so you have this giant mess where like, taxpayer dollars pay someone to sit there and collect all this like very private survey information making typo after typo that's really difficult to check and the information goes to this one company and that leads to you know bad decisions and so you know if you have like 137 factors entered by hand that means that there's at least a one if there's at least if there's a one percent error rate on the data entry then there's at least a 75 percent chance of at least one typo on a survey <laughs> so you know, this leads to bad decisions, right? Um, people, like this is an article, for instance, where someone was given years of extra prison time because of a typographical error on their compass score. And what we found in the Florida data is this, that this happens often. And this is not how the justice system is supposed to work. People are supposed to make decisions, not typographical errors. You shouldn't be able to get years of extra prison time from a typo. So um, do you really need compass? Well, we did an experiment to try to figure that out. Um, we compared Compass to our latest machine learning method at the time. Um, this is a few years ago. And the machine learning method was called Corals. And Corals is an optimal decision tree a problem. It's optimal decision list, so one-sided decision trees. And the machine learning model that we got on the Florida data set, the, ProPublica, um, the data set that ProPublica used from Broward County, Florida, um, it produced a very simple model. Like, we thought that, like, that, that's the whole model right there. We thought that it wouldn't have a chance competing against Compass, but it did. Okay, so what I'm showing you is tenfold cross validation accuracy, Compass versus Corals. And what was kind of shocking is that no matter which machine learning method we chose, um, they all seemed seem to perform the same, no matter whether they were a super complicated black box. Uh, support vector machines with radial basis function kernels or random forests or anything like that. So um, yeah, so basically what we found again the same thing, right? These models don't really need anything about race and even better, you can get a model, you can use a model that's completely transparent. Okay, so Propub what ProPublica didn't say was that there are a lot of really good reasons to avoid black box models. 
So avoiding black box models helps us to investigate fairness more easily and avoid dubious science like the ProPublica article. <laughs> uh, it also, avoiding black box models also helps us to reduce typographical errors. It allows error checking on the spot. It also helps make the system fairer and safer overall. Um, it also alleviates some due process issues where people have a right to understand how the decision is being made about them. And also, avoiding black box models actually doesn't harm predictive performance. So it's kind of shocking that we are still using Compass. And uh, in fact, we're using black box models still for many hot stakes decisions. Okay, so going forward, I would like to um, have us really make a true attempt to stop this crazy cycle of narrow reviewing. We need to improve our reviewing processes to be more in line with societal goals and, and inclusion. And second, I think we should focus more on the data. We should focus on what we really need in society to make us more aligned with making a positive difference. Thank you.